All right, so we have uh, we have Anthony Tolda, you know, a two-time congressional candidate in New York for for New York City, and you know he's he's created the shadow militia that that wants to shadow, you know. All right, so recently you heard the march is off, right? What what are your thoughts on that? Well, I heard that. Um, just to tell the listeners real quick, I, I founded the Shadow Militia, which our objective is to basically go wherever the Kokeshites, as I like to call them, go. We will shadow them, and we will prevent them from doing anything violent. And uh, we will be prepared to use any means necessary to neutralize them if they become violent. Um, also, I founded the Sovereignty Party of America, so... Uh, to, to give some credit to what you were saying earlier, um, and and even you know ironically what Adam's getting at is yes we take the, our our country back at the state level and that's a big part of the reason I founded the Sovereignty Party of America. Okay, now you know with him canceling it and saying they're going to march on the state capitals, are you still going to have the shadow militia in Washington D.C.? And I'll tell you why. Uh, we have some psychological data that the um, that the Sovereignty Party of American National Council has compiled and analyzed. Uh, myself, I'm an expert in the field of ponderology, which is uh, the field of social psychology that you can't even get a doctorate in. There's no coursework for it. But if there ever was any coursework, um, I would certainly be the one doing it with what I went on with in the last election cycle and... Um, and some people in the Libertarian Party and, and what I went through um, getting on the Republican uh, ballot legally and then being thrown off of it in a fraudulent matter, uh, manner. And then now what we're dealing with with these Kakesh issues, uh, you know, I could I could probably write a book on ponderology in practice, um, you know, in modern day um, context. Uh, the book uh, Political Ponderology was written back from um, – in the 40s and 50s when communism was taking over Poland, that some psychology students noticed that their teachers changed and the, um, the concepts being taught changed drastically, and they knew something was up. So they began compiling data on, um, on how society began changing, and they noticed how people with various mental disorders were able to identify each other and had an uncanny ability to work towards, uh, towards evil goals together. Okay, and and for those who've not heard of this before, it is essentially that there are certain people who are essentially almost, if not completely, psychopathic, and they, of course, crave power, and they don't have normal human emotions like empathy. Is is that what ponderology is? Well, that's part of it. Um, and just to just to clarify, when people say psychopath and sociopath, oftentimes they intermingle the terms. A psychopath is somebody that is born biologically differently. Um, so the guys are going to hate me right now and the ladies are going to love me. 10% of males are born with some form of psychosis or psychopathy and only 1 in 100 females, thankfully for this world, are born with some um, type of um, <clears throat> psychopathy or, um, or um, psychosis. So when you average that out, you know, the world is approximately 50% male, 50% female, um, you know, slight deviations uh, on what country you're in, but it basically balances out to approximately 5% of the population is just born biologically different without senses of empathy or remorse or guilt. And then a sociopath is somebody that learns or assimilates to that type of behavior through being around and learning it from psychopaths. Okay, and what, we're talking about this because you suspect that Adam Kokesh may be one of these people? Is that kind of where you're going? Well, it, it's impossible for us to, to attempt to diagnose him as a psychopath without actual physical um, biological data, which is just way outside of um, any, any realm of being logistically possible. In regards to diagnosing for antisocial personality disorder, which is more commonly referred to and much less accurately referred to as sociopathy, um, that's something where there are a few different checklists, essentially, um, that, are, that are considered industry standard practice. And as you go through these lists, um, you assessing the individual, um, their psychology, their, uh, their psyche, if they meet, a, meet or exceed a qualifying number on these lists, 
then they're considered at high potential to actually be diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. Now, we have um, a psychologist requested to remain anonymous, and I've honored that agreement. And uh, he and I spoke, and we discussed. You know, we went through the lists, um, and, and he qualified uh, not only to the minimum number uh, needed to qualify on the checklists, but he, he actually exceeded those numbers on every list. So he's, uh, he's a very high probability to be diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, but to officially do that, you need a one-on-one -on -one meeting. And so we're not claiming that we've done that. We're telling people the truth that, um, that we're extremely confident if, if we could actually have him diagnosed that we would get an affirmative diagnosis for that. Okay. Now, myself, I've never been a follower or a listener of Adam Kokash in any way, but I remember a couple months ago, you know, he was doing weed or smoking a pipe on air or something, and, and I put out a, a letter on Facebook and said, look, this makes us look bad, this isn't good or whatever, and in my yeah. opinion, you know, if somebody, I mean, to me, he seems like he's got an ego and he puts what he wants to do ahead of what's best for the movement. We see a lot of people like this time to time, but he seems to be like that pretty uh, pretty often. Is that a part of, of that behavior trait, you think? Well, part of it is, um, is thrill-seeking. And, you know, there, there's a difference between somebody that likes to be an adventurous and, and live a healthy lifestyle and, and take some, uh, some, some thrill-seeking, uh, you know, like certain physical... Uh, uh, sports or, um, uh, you know, rock climbing, you know, canoeing, something like that. that that's one type of thrill-seeking. But the, the reckless thrill-seeking is really what's, um, what's a sign of somebody with antisocial personality disorder. And he seems to have this reckless thrill-seeking, you know, constantly, you know, um, you know, putting himself in positions where he knows he's going to get arrested. He's even bought insurance for being arrested right now, which I have to admit is, is kind of clever and, and kind of entertaining. But... Um, you know, at the same time, it's just, you know, basically admitting, yes, I, I know that I'm intentionally getting arrested all the time, so I may as well buy insurance for it. Um, and, you know, so the, the thrill-seeking, you know, he needs the thrill and also the attention because there's a narcissism there as well. So, you know, it's like uh, getting back to um, basic psychology, uh, they would they would discuss how in, with children sometimes they get the... Um, the good attention, bad attention. If the child is starved for attention, you know, they'll start to sometimes act up because the bad attention is better for the child in their uh, perception than the no attention at all. So, you know, Adam feels the need for this attention, whether it's good, bad, or a mixture, or it gets people arguing. And when he does these things, um, especially with this proposed march, he, you know, he gets people paying attention and, and sometimes in heated arguments. Okay, now seeing that the the march, well, I don't know. Did he say the march is canceled, or he said I'm not going to lead it? He said, you know, I want people to march in their state capitals, and something about he's, I'm going to California. I mean, what is this about? He's going to California. What do you think? What do you think's going on there? Well, California, um, as far as I know, they're pretty relaxed with their carry laws. So I think that he might actually be trying to, you know, go to a state where he thinks he could pull this off without losing his gun rights for the rest of his life. Um, so that might be a strategic move for him. Also, I'd like to point out this was less than 24 hours after I put out a video, um, you know, with some, some different evidence on it where I basically proved that, um, that what he's planning to do on sea was an invasion that, um, that according to the Organic Act and the Residency Act and Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, he had no constitutional grounds to, uh, to assume the role of a militia and march into D.C., and that uh, any Supreme Court ruling that he was claiming applied does not apply, and that was, that was what the Organic Act was passed to, um, to put into stone, so to say. Uh, the Founding Fathers passed the Organic Act in 1801, and the reason they titled it the Organic Act it was because they found it ridiculous that they even had to pass it, because they had felt that the Residency Act and Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution made things crystal clear that, um, that, 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 the, that Washington, D.C. has a specific and special sovereignty status that is beyond the uh, sovereignty status of counties in the context of the county sheriff having supreme rule 
um, or the context of states having sovereignty from the Union, D.C. has a special and, um, and privileged uh, sovereignty status compared to our other concepts of sovereignty. So we, there's degrees of sovereignty um, in a legal and constitutional context. And I think that what Adam was failing to understand was the heightened degree of sovereignty that D.C. has. Okay. Now, just to let you know, I've uh, I'm I'm in the process of downloading the two videos that you you threw in the uh, the chat there, and you know we have heard some. Just so you know. What's that? If you download and re-upload, the notes won't work. They 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 come off. I don't know why, but that's how it works. If, if you play the raw film from the original YouTube channel, the notes will work. But if you download and re-upload, they will not work. Okay. Yeah. Was that the first one or the second one you dropped in, or are they both the same? Oh, it's two different videos. One shows how the um, how the polymerization works, which is, uh, I guess, a clinical way of of saying how the um, the brainwashing and retaining of, of people that um, take over a political system or a religious um, group or um, basically any social group this can happen to. No, no, no walk of life. Um, is exempt from potential polarization. Right. Now, I remember that video because you showed it to me before, and it's from, you know, a lot of that video is from a movie called Jay and Silent Bob, and and it kind of made me wonder, you know, because it, it showed how somebody can essentially educate people and be telling the truth but at the same time, be manipulating them. And I kind of thought about even myself and my own broadcast. I mean, I am educating people and I'm telling them the truth. And frankly, if I could manipulate them to fight the New World Order, I would. And maybe in some way I am. What separates the kind of person that you show in that video from someone like me? Well, I mean, it has to do with couple of things. Um, one is, you know, are you persuading people or are you manipulating people? I think there's a difference between politely persuading, um, you know, using a Ron Paul or a Rand Paul as, example, as an example. When you see them speak, it seems to me like they're more politely persuading. When you watch video and, and you see the, uh, the man with the hidden agenda, um, he's clearly not politely persuading. Um, he's manipulating. So there's some differences there. Um, and also it, it depends on, you know, if your motive, if you're stating your motive is to fight the New World Order and that's what you're asking people to do, then there's no ulterior motive. You've been very clear about what your intentions are. But when you're, um, when you're manipulating, there's often times an ulterior motive. And so that's, that's another distinction and, and great difference. So if both of these things have to do with assuming alpha roles in life, whether you host a broadcast or whether you're, you know, manipulating a crowd and, um, you know, the, the alpha role itself is not the problem. It's, you know, the, the intent of the person assuming such role and the unfortunate fact that the masses often are just attracted to the individual that's wielding power and not always vetting the, um, the motives and the psyche of the person that's wielding power. Okay, and, you know, interestingly, it was also, it, it was basically a guy in a store telling people you should not be smoking cigarettes here, have this gum instead, and he turned out to be a salesman of the gum. So that that's kind of, he had a self-gain, a profit motive of some sort, right? Right. It was essentially um, his sales pitch. You know, I was, I'm a, I'm a, as I like to say, I'm a reformed financial consultant. I, uh, I was in the, uh, the finance industry before uh, the financial collapse, and then as it was happening, the more I saw, the more I, I just was like, I can't do this anymore. This is just, it's ridiculous. I didn't understand when I when I first went into the industry. I was a tradesman, and then somebody recruited me, and uh, I, I gave it a shot. I, you know, I was trying to just make a better life for myself. I had no idea um, how how um, shady of an industry it is, and, and how deep the betrayal went. It was before I started awakening. Right. Yeah. There are so many people in the truth movement who have stories like that. I have a personal friend who. You know, she was a nurse, and she did the vaccinations, vaccinated who knows how many people, and when she found out the truth, she was devastated, and she left the mm -hmm. medical industry altogether, and 
Okay, so some wow. you know our our previous broadcaster Mike just sent me something that relates to all this. It's just a, a five second thing. I'm gonna go ahead and show it. It's his interview with Danny Panzella. Um, I don't know that you'll be able to hear it if you're not watching the feed, but I'm gonna go ahead and play it, and then I'll I'll let you know what it says. Okay. Said it before. Either Kokesh has titanium balls, or he's a cop. Okay, so that was Danny Panzella. And he said either Kokesh has titanium balls or he's a cop. What would you say to that, Anthony? I'm shocked that um, that Danny actually said that. Um, the second part, um, or he's a cop. I don't, I don't know if he's been seeing some of my videos because I know he saw at least one of them and um, he wasn't very supportive of my efforts, but maybe he saw something that, um, that clicked with him. I don't know. Well, I mean, sometimes people don't want to believe. I mean, I, I'm always amazed at how we can be surrounded by operatives and people don't want to believe that they're operatives. And it's because the people in the movement, by and large, are good-hearted people, self-sacrificing people who are working to, you know, for no self-gain to help others. And so it's almost not within the realm of possibility for them to imagine that this person is actually playing for the other team, but too often I find it's the case. And, you know, he said it. I just showed the video of him saying it. So, right. you know, well, I mean. This is interesting. And I, I took this note down from the book Political Ponderology, and it, it was actually describing um, what you just addressed. And it said that um, sometimes people on discovering, you know, that somebody's a fraud that they trusted, they experience shock and disintegration, and that, um, because they've discovered that they've been a victim of traumatizing influence of a macrosocial pathological phenomenon. So that's that's what I would call what goes on with Obama. You know, you could you could come at somebody and say, well, he, you know, he got his political career started in the in the living room of William Ayers, and um, you know, they 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 were domestic terrorists, and you know, he's. Uh, he's not an American. He's not constitutionally eligible, and you could walk somebody through all of these things, and and because of it, um, of their unwillingness to believe, their shock and uh, disintegration, they just continue to follow along, and you know maybe some of them eventually come around. But it's a similar thing with uh, with the case of Adam Kakesh. There's all this evidence out there about his ties to Code Pink, and you know Code Pink working hand-in-glove with Westboro Baptist Church to harass uh, families, grieving families of uh, fallen soldiers. The Patriot Guard Riders have to show up and act as a physical barrier so the, uh, the families don't have to see all these hate signs uh, that, these, that these crazy protesters that, you know, are, seem to be friend of that, Adams. Um, and, that, you know, this is one of the most ironic things about, uh, about Adam and his whole pitch and the reason, you know, people don't want to question him is, oh, you know, he's a veteran and well, yeah, okay, so he's a veteran, but he didn't have a whole lot of time in. He got demoted. He was given a general discharge, which isn't as bad as dishonorable, but isn't as good as honorable. It, it means he did something that they didn't like, and it was because he kept going to protests in uniform, and he was repeatedly told not to. He was originally going to get honorable. Uh, and he spent the majority of his time in a classroom, in, in psychology classes, essentially learning how to bend the minds of people at the will of our government, and he was really never in a combat situation for a guy that claims to have post-traumatic stress disorder. I don't know where it came from because the only documented um, part of his service where he was actually outside of the classroom was essentially an 18-day field trip around some different places in the Middle East. Okay, and you hit upon a part there that to me is the most concerning that as Alex Jones stated live on air during his interview with Adam Kokesh, he said, you were in PSYOPs. He said, you're a Marine, you were in PSYOPs, and Kokesh did not counter that. He was in psychological operations, and, and that is, to me, the most scary thing. that We're going to have somebody who was in PSYOPs lead an armed march on Washington, D.C. That's like shooting yourself in the head, in my opinion. Now, you seem to know a lot about psychology. Did you, I mean, where did you learn these things? Are you self-researched, or, or how did you come by all this? You know, a lot of people don't know this, but half of the founding fathers were self-learned men. And that was the term they used, self-learned. I tend to say self-educated, but I like to point out that history there. 
Um, I did, you know, briefly, I went to college. I took one semester. It took me a long time to get there. I didn't want to go into debt and I became the man of my house at a young age. Um, so I put off attempting college. And once I went, they waited until I couldn't get my money back and then duped me into getting a visa's month for Bella vaccine, which I had a very bad reaction to. And that kind of turned me off to, um, to college and, and the physically, uh, in the context of physically going to one. And I realized that, um, that all along I had been educating myself anyway, and that I should just, you know, consider, uh, continue pursuing my personal studies because I don't need a piece of paper to prove that I'm knowledgeable or an expert in certain things. I just need the knowledge and that somebody wants to verify what I'm saying, you know, they can make the effort to do so. I have no reason to lie or mislead uh, people, and I do my best to be as accurate and factual as possible. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you when I'm giving you my opinion or speculation, and I'll tell you when I'm giving you a fact. Right. Well, I have a lot more respect for people who learned on their own than people who paid tens of thousands of dollars to sit in a classroom and be indoctrinated because I see that all as a control system. So I'm actually glad to hear that. Now, let's talk about this proposed armed march on D.C., which has now, uh, at least apparently, been canceled. I mean, my problem with it from the get-go was that he was advocating that everybody submit to arrest. And of course, the first thing I did was looked up the penalty for having a gun in, in Washington, D.C., and it's one to five years in prison. I mean, are people retarded that they would go there and and volunteer for one to five years in prison? And what other problems do you see with this whole concept that he created to begin with? Well, it's an interesting case with DC. They're not they're not necessarily foreign land, but in a in a sense they are. It's not technically in a legal context American soil because they enjoy special sovereignty status to a point where they're not even considered America. That's how uh, that's how privileged their specific uh, sovereignty status is, and that's you know permissible. By the uh, by, Article One, Section Eight in the Constitution, and was signed into law by George Washington himself uh, with the Residency Act, and then uh, Congress reinforced that with the Organic Act of 1801 because there was some rumblings about trying to make some decisions that would affect D.C. through the court system, and uh, the founders thought this was just crazy; they couldn't believe it, and they said, "Well, we have to, you will get to pass this bill." so that we can make it crystal clear our intent was to not have the court systems have jurisdiction over D.C., that only the federal government should have jurisdiction over D.C. And the reason this all came about, um, and, and you know, the reason the Founding Fathers permitted this in the Constitution but did not write it into the Constitution is because they were using good judgment. They didn't know if it was going to be necessary, but they suspected, um, they had a strong suspicion that um, if they attempted to you know, venture this new nation without doing it, that um, that they may need it eventually, and that they would be sorely mistaken if they didn't provide for the opportunity to constitutionally do so. So they left the door open for it, and uh, there was um, there was a Philadelphia um, revolt. That's not what it was called, though. Um, it was, what it was was there was some unpaid troops. Uh, it was during times of financial hardship and with some unpaid troops that marched on Congress when they were meeting in Philadelphia. And as a result of that, and this is a testament to how good the government worked back then uh, in, in the opinion of the Constitution was for a small government person, it took them seven years to pass the Residency Act after this incident. So, you know, we have an incident in America today and it's, oh, we need a bill to fix this right away. And uh, you know, all of a sudden you have this sweeping new legislation being ran down the people's throats. And, they, you know, they had an incident where, you know, armed troops marched on a meeting of Congress to say, where's our money? And it takes them seven years to pass the Residency Act, which um, I think is a testament to, to how our government was originally intended to be and then what we should seek to restore it to. Right. And I just want to make sure that people understand what you're saying that the government taking seven years to make that change meant that the government didn't just change day to day. It stayed the same. People understood it, understood how it worked. 
And if any, you know, significant change happened, it happened with a lot of careful consideration and everybody, everybody got to weigh in where now we get 10,000 page bills dumped. The congressmen don't even read them and it gets passed. And we have people like Nancy Pelosi say, well, we have to pass the bill so that you can see what is in it. What a change we've had from then to now. Yes, it's it's quite um, quite a fall from the original intent, and I suppose that's part of you know Adam's points. But it's it's you know what's carried on in the spirit of our people, you can't take that away from us. And we have you know little victories all the time. And uh, Bob said in his video, we just defeated a federal gun control bill. It was brought about by uh, an awful tragedy. And what are you worried about? It's just. It's ridiculous, just hysteria. And this is what somebody with what I suspect is Adam's condition does. They, uh, they manipulate other people, um, you know, by stimulating their emotions. And Obama does the same thing. It's the same exact playbook Obama uses when he tries to stir up a, a, a anger between the classes or the races. It's, it's all about stirring up the emotions because once you stir up someone's emotions, they become more susceptible to the person uh, stirring up the emotions to implant um, what they want this person to think or behave like because they're in that emotional state. Their defenses are down um, to that person that puts them in that emotional state. And if that person does so in a way where they can make themselves look like they're providing help, that makes the person even more vulnerable to the suggestion and to the implanting of the, of the behavior. It's essentially, you know, brainwashing technique. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I see what Kokesh tried to do with this armed march on D.C. as essentially agenda of the New World Order. They just had the Supreme Court, you know, rule that individual Americans have a right to keep and bear arms, period. They lost on gun control. So why would we march on D.C. and give them an excuse to, you know, bring that back into the limelight? And, you know, I look at the timing of it. I look at who it benefits. And to me, it's just, it's, it really looks like, and Obama had on his Facebook page, that, and, and you heard him say in the video where he was asked about his working for the Russian television station, that he was the Obama's revolution czar, and he had that on his wall. I mean, do you think we're dealing well, with, oh, go ahead. I, I apologize. What were you going to ask? Well, I mean, do you think he's got a massive ego? Because, you know, you talk about the psychological aspect and, you know, he, he may have this mental disorder. To me, I see a, a paid enemy of the American people. That's what I see. I, I think it's a possibility. Um, what my main focus has been is, is um, illustrating that even if he's right about a lot of things, that, you know, he's probably just saying what you want to hear one thing and for another um, I feel like I can prove to a certain degree that the man is just not fit for leadership roles in life regardless of how good he sounds or how much he's right there's something fundamentally wrong there that uh, you know our government's basically run by these people with antisocial personality disorders in the first place so how on earth could somebody you know expect me to buy into the idea that well, trust this guy with the antisocial personality disorder because he's saying what you want to hear and he's going to be a lot better than that group of guys with the antisocial personality disorders. It's just, it's a ridiculous concept to me. But for him to say that he's Obama's revolutions are, and a lot of people that have antisocial personality disorder, they're flamboyant and, and, um, and they're egotistical to a point where they'll tell you right to your face what they're intending on doing and say it with a smile, and it sounds so goofy and outlandish and crazy um, that that people, you know, just think, "Oh, so and so's just joking." They, they're just that's just the kind of person they are, and well, they're not joking. They're telling you what they're going to do, and they're so arrogant about their ability to manipulate you and pull it off that they'll tell you to your face and then get away with it, and you still won't even expect it after they told you. Right, just like Obama before he was elected, you know, he said that. You know, some businesses would necessarily be bankrupted, you know, about the energy companies or something. He he flat out said what he was going to do, and then he did it, and he still has supporters out there. It's it's crazy, but, you know, what was it Hitler that said, the, the greater the lie, the more people will believe it. And, and he said, you know, the more we do to you, 
the less you believe we're doing it. Yes, because it, it works through incrementalism. So if you recall, you know, Adam had that whole, um, you know, dance party on the, uh, on the, I want to say, Jefferson Monument. Right. It was in D.C., though, I believe, right? I think so, yeah. So this was this is the incrementalism. I'll get people used to protesting in D.C., right? So come have this dance event. And then all of a sudden now it's a march on D.C., and he's calling it the Revolutionary American Army. Well, you know... When Hitler rose to power, and I'm not saying, you know, Adam Hitler, I'm just saying when Hitler rose to power, you know, he had his own, you know, thug squad, the the SS, whomever, um, and uh, they, um, their whole thing was to show up at political events with him and, you know, cause a ruckus and essentially take over and then coerce the people at the political event to bend to the will of Hitler. So... If Adam's going to start running around politically with his own army, uh, you know, I really felt no recourse but to found the um, found the shadow militia. And, you know, people could say, well, you're doing the same thing. But there's a difference in the context in which I'm founding the shadow militia. You know, with Adam and his army, you know, he fancies himself the next George Washington, and he's the commander and all this stuff. I founded shadow militia to encourage local um, sovereign um, units of, of the shadow militia, and I intended to found it just as a central intelligence resource. So, you know, we'll have intelligence updates for people that are uh, that are members of shadow militia. We'll have suggestions and um, and and you know intelligence releases, but we're not going to really not going to give orders so much. You know, we'll give recommendations. We'll we'll urge um, you know the the units to do something, but you know we're not going to give orders. It's, it's a difference. And I want them to be self-directed, sovereign state um, militias. I'd rather there be less leaders. Now, this is, this is something, um, more leaders, rather. I'm, I'd rather not be a, um, such a, a large role leader in this. And it's a very clever tactic that Occupy Wall Street used for their own protection. Well, if we don't have any leaders, you know, who are they going to come after? So if shadow militia has no leaders, there's nobody to come after, and and also it's. I just feel like it's more honorable and honest of me to just say, look, this is my concept. I'm trying to help everybody. Help, I'm encouraging you to help yourselves. This is the means I'm recommending you do it, and then you either do it or you don't. There's a big difference between that and and seeking to run an army. Right now, you know, I was listening to Alex Jones today because I'm wondering if what you're doing isn't kind of a natural thing that's starting to happen in other places. Somebody called in and said, and I think he was referring to where Kokash was arrested, that Alex Jones was referring to, you know, these people with, uh, like, you know, something around their arms, some kind of armband or something as as feds, as federal government. And somebody called in and said, no, they weren't feds. That was the Phil, Philly Watchmen or the Philadelphia Watchmen. So it sounds like this kind of thing is starting to spring up and and it sounds like a good idea to me, of course. You know, the more people we have participating and, and awake and aware, the better. Now, this shadow militia, can you talk about, you know, where you see this going? Do you have a website yet? Are you sure you want to stick with that name? Because I've seen people say, you know, with the term shadow government out there, shadow militia might not be the best name. What are your thoughts on that? I was actually thinking of extending it to... Shadow Militia Archangels, um, because that, you know, at least adds, um, you know, a, a, a name that is, it ends on a positive. Right. You know, Archangels, you know, it's showing that you're a good guy. Um, and, and the reason for the name Shadow Militia, for anybody that's concerned, Shadow Government, Shadow Militia, because we're shadowing the Kokeshite Army, which is what I call them, uh, for reasons of brevity and, and also, um, I just, I feel like they're kind of brainwashed, and it, you know, they, it reminds me almost of Star Wars, where you had the clone army that that came to assassinate all the Jedi. You know, you have these Kakeshites that are going to assassinate all the Liberty uh, Patriot people if we let them gain momentum and control what's going on, and if we don't stop them. So, you know, you have the Kakeshite army, and we exist to shadow them, and they're public about their actions all the time. Um, and even if they weren't, you know, we would still find ways to shadow them, and we're, we're going to be their shadow. Wherever the Kakeshite army is, 
you will find shadow militia, and we're just going to make sure that they stay in line. We're not looking to stop them from exercising their rights, and we've been accused of that. People say, well, you're taking away their First and Second Amendment rights. What are you doing? No, we're not doing that. We're just making sure that they don't get violent as they exercise those rights. We're going to be prepared to neutralize any violence that comes from them. We're not going to incite any violence. Most certainly not. We're going to be there essentially as a citizen set of checks and balances. We have checks and balances in our government to make the government, to attempt to make the government work more efficiently. So if we're going to talk about this exercising of Second Amendment rights in a way that's a bit extreme, um, but co it is constitutional in the 50 state capitals. I can't say that it's not, and I wouldn't say that it's not. It's unconstitutional when you attempt to do it in D.C. because of Article 1, Section 8, the Organic Act, and the Residency Act. Um, but the 50 state capitals, I can't say that that's unconstitutional because it's not. It's, it's entirely constitutional. But do I trust the Kakeshite army to do this responsibly? No, not at all. So if we're there with shadow militia and every time they do it and they know that we're there and they know that the guy ne right next to him could take him out in a second if he incites violence, then they're a lot less likely to incite violence. So, you know, we're, we're looking more to win this battle psychologically. We don't want it to get physical. We want to win psychologically, and that should be good enough. Okay, well, you know, one of the things that, that I was concerned about with this March on D.C., is that the goal of it was to teach people to submit to arrest, even with guns, on their backs. In other words, a, a psychological operation that never gets violent, but does the damage of training the American people like dogs, that it doesn't matter what you do, you're always going to submit to arrest and you're always going to lose. What do you think the, the shadow militia would, couldn't do anything there, could they? Well, I mean, we can't prevent people from, you know turning in their weapons for putting themselves in a ridiculously retarded scenario. But at least if we're there and we see them regressing, um, we could either um, threaten to or neutralize that aggression. I w we would certainly issue a warning to anybody before, um, before any further action was taken. Uh, you know, we're not, looking, we're not looking to have a short fuse here. We're looking to have an extremely long fuse, and we're looking to be responsible and we're looking to show the American public that gun rights can be exercised responsibly, even in an extreme case of you know, protesting the capitals on Independence Day simultaneously. And that's, that's not an easy task to prove that to the American public. And I look at this as a great test of how are we going to shape public opinion on the Second Amendment on Independence Day. We have two choices. We could leave the Kakeshite army unchecked and risk severe damage to public opinion on the Second Amendment, which shouldn't even matter because it's a natural right, but unfortunately, it matters. Um, so we could leave them unchecked and risk irreparable damage to the, the public opinion on Second Amendment, which would probably affect it sooner or later. Um, or we could step up, be responsible, take the risks we need to take, um, be intelligent about it, be covert about it, um, work with each other, make every attempt to work with the, uh, the county sheriffs of the counties that uh, the state capitals are in, uh, make every effort to work with local law enforcement so we're not concerned about friendly fire, um, you know, find some way to have identification between ourselves and local law enforcement, and we stress local law enforcement because we don't trust the federal agencies. Now, we put out a national security brief through the Sovereignty Party of America National Council, and that was sent to a member of the NSA that we we know through one of our members and trust. I mean, there are active duty oath keepers in all all government organizations. Some of them very high up, and we're we're very fortunate and very blessed that that's the case. So we got it to an oath keeper in the NSA, and we have not received communication back yet, but we are expecting it soon. Okay, now you know when you're talking about the logistics of this situation, it kind of makes me realize why these, you know, what I hear, the the Philly or the Philadelphia watchmen would have armbands on if they had an agreement with, for instance, the local police force. Look, we're going to be there. We're going to be keeping an eye on things. We'll be the ones yet wearing the yellow armbands, for instance. Is that kind of yeah. the kind of thing you might consider? Well, absolutely. And, you know, I'm actually, I'm part of an organization that does citizen patrols. And because they're a 501c3, when I'm speaking in a political context, I'm not allowed to disclose the name. 
Um, but, you know, we don't carry weapons. You know, not every, um, not every civilian patrol is the same. I don't know anything about the Watchmen, and the Shadow Militia certainly intends to carry weapons. Um, but in, with this group, we do not carry weapons. And, uh, you know, we, we're out there in rough neighborhoods where, you know, people get shot. We're putting our lives on the line for no money, no benefits, um, you know, no glory. I can't even say the name, you know, um, when I'm speaking in a political context, um, just out of respect for the 501c3. So it really does come from the heart um, that the people that do this. Okay. Now, there are, there are several directions I'd like to go with, with our discussion, but one of them, you've mentioned his affiliation with Code Pink, and I've shown press conferences here on air and, and shown very clearly that when Code Pink was, you know, allegedly protesting, for instance, the NRA press conference, they were miked in. They were wearing microphones jacked into that same press conference and that it was all a, a psyop their processor a psyop code pink is working with the new world order and kokesh is working with code pink i got a picture of him holding cindy sheehan's hand so i mean right. how can anybody right. think this guy's legit right and he's he's also friends with uh, medea benjamin who's a co founder she's a co-founder of code pink if you google search his name and you write and and then uh, either one of those names uh, cindy sheehan or uh Media Benjamin, hits pop up and you see them that they've organized protests together. I mean, you know, when you think about it, when somebody does something for um, for for a covert mission, whether it's say the CIA, for example, I was part of a, a civilian's petty trial. It's spelled P E T I T. It's pronounced petty. Civilian's petty trial at, at Otla Church in Harlem, and they actually put Obama, the CIA, and Columbia University on trial in a manner that is, um, you know, according to our laws, it, it was um, legally valid. The problem lies with enforcing the findings. Okay. is that That's kind of like, uh, what was it, Reverend Manning how, had a trial of Obama or something back in the day? It, yes, Pastor Manning, I was actually I was at that trial, and I got uh, some of the neighbors were yelling at me the first day um, in front. In fact, if you go to Salon.com on YouTube, if you write Salon, uh, look at their channel, it's one, I think it's still one of the top hits on the channel. It's called Birthers vs. Neighbors, and this woman's screaming in my face, and she's calling me a racist, and I ask her flat out. I said, what did I say It was racist, ma'am? And she goes, you ain't said us. And uh, she admits that I didn't say anything racist. I thought it was, that was, you know, that made the experience worth it, is being able to have her on film just admitting that she called me a racist for no reason. Right. Okay, now, you also earlier mentioned the, the Kokeshite, as you refer to them, Kokeshite thugs. And and this might be new to a lot of people, but and, and I don't honestly even know if you're really aware of it, but we've found ties between Adam Kokesh and his, I don't know if you can call it an organization, because there seems to be a lot of young kids involved, but, uh, but them and the gang called the Crips. Do you think yes. that, that this effort to say, okay, never mind, we're not going to march on D.C., we're going to march on all 50 capitals, might be a way to make it impossible for them to be shadowed? Well, no, because I, I put out this recruitment video, and it was specifically requesting that um, that we were appealing to Oath Keepers and Patriot God Riders as individuals, not on an entire organizational basis because their groups are 501c3s, and I know a lot of, about that, and you have to be very careful when you're a 501c3. You could lose a status, and that it's tax-exempt. So you can go from you know, being tax-exempt to not being tax-exempt, and that would put some of these organizations uh, out of business or make, uh, make things a lot harder for them. So I've, we specifically said in the video that we are, we are appealing to these two groups on an individual basis. Basically, we're, we're asking the members of those groups to review the material, look at the national security briefing, and, uh, and decide for themselves if they want to help or not. And if, if they do help, that we are suggesting that um, that there'll be a shadow militia unit and that they'll be sovereign within their state and just work with other people and, and figure out how they're going to defend our state capitals on Independence Day. And I have enough faith in the American people um, and and our, uh, our Oath Keepers and our Patriot Guard whose numbers are pretty massive I have enough faith that we have enough time, um, and those those people are going to do the right thing, and um, and we're going to have a bulletproof plan for national security 
on Independence Day. So I, I, I actually, you know, for as much as I'm at odds with Adam, as much as I suspect he could be a plant or reckless or has antisocial personality disorder, I'm forced to do whatever I can do to actually try to help him not get hurt this day because he's going to hurt other people with him if, um, if nobody protects him. So I'm trying to protect all of us from the fallout of the repercussions of rash actions left unchecked by Adam and the Kakeshites. I'm trying to protect all of us from the fallout. I'm trying to protect the Kakeshites, and I'm even trying to protect Kakesh as much as I'm at odds with them, and I'm furious with them. I forgive them, um, but I'm still furious with them, and I'm not going to forget, and I'm not going to stop, and he's not going to stop either. So the, um, the best way to make sure that we come out of this unscathed or give us the best probability of coming out unscathed is to call on our Oath Keepers, our Patriot Guard Riders. The same video, I call on the Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street to put their differences aside just for the day and to, um, to Tea Party and Occupy their state capitals. And then uh, I, I even noted that um, there's documented cases of Occupy Wall Street neutralizing a potential violent threat by surrounding the, um, the person with love. There was this story about this big guy that stood up and said, does anybody want to fight me? Who wants to fight me? And they, they got in a circle and held hands and they said, you know, we love you, brother. Nobody wants to fight you and all this stuff. And he got freaked out and ran away. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, so... so I think it's a valuable, valuable lesson to be learned from that. So hopefully we can all come together and have a great independence day together. And Adam and the Kakeshites can carry weapons and the shadow militia can carry weapons and the government can carry weapons and no one will get hurt. Now, you, you say no one will get hurt, and obviously that's what everyone would hope to be the case. I'm but, saying I do think no one will get hurt, and we're trying to minimize the possibility of that. And right. There is a set of checks and balances where we're at least making things statistically less likely um, to get to a point of aggression because there's a set of checks and balances. We're just trying to make the odds better, and that's all we can, that's all we can aim to do. We can't guarantee Right. Um, that there any problems. Okay, now what about when you throw a gang like the Crips in the mix? I mean, how do you think that might affect things? What do you think their role with Adam Kokesh and his organization is? What do you think's going on there? Well, I mean, Adam is stated that he's attempting to, you know, have an army. So you can't have an army if you don't have, you know, enough recruits and, you know, to to have any type of operations in America, you're going to need a lot of recruits. So he, you know, how many places does he have to go? You know, um, different gangs. I, I have intelligence say, stating that he made a post on a, a Black Panthers page and the Black Panthers page title stated that they wanted to harm or kill police officers. And I don't know if he's actually made a deal with the Black Panthers or if he's just attempting to court them. But I know that at the very least, there was some communication between Kakesh's Facebook page and its Black Panther page that, that's threatening to kill law enforcement officers. Okay. Now, interestingly, we, we've talked about how we've both received phone calls from Kokesh lackeys. In my case, you know, one of them called me pretending to be NYPD saying, you know, oh, we found a suspicious substance and all this stuff. And, I mean, it was laughable. And, and the person making the call, talking to me, was clearly very nervous. And, and you right. say you got a call also. Can you talk about the call that you got? Yes, he seemed kind of nervous, too. Um, guy sounded pretty young. I could tell he probably knew some of the people that I know here from the local Libertarian Party, just from the names that he was dropping. And, uh, and I gave him some information about those people that he found a little bit shocking. Um, so, uh, you know, he was pretending to be media so that I would talk to him. And I knew, you know, I knew who he was. And he asked me a couple of questions. He goes, you know, you say that you forgive Adam. He said, like, is that true? And he sounded surprised by that, that I forgive Adam. And uh, you know, how could, how can I not forgive him? It's not, you know, his father was a venture capitalist, um, a venture capitalist crook. Um, who was in the same ballpark as Bernie Madoff, went to jail, uh, scammed a lot of people. So, you know, we on the National Council for Sovereignty Party of America, we suspect that, you know, Adam uh, has antisocial personality disorder. We also suspect his father has it, and we suspect that he learned, because it is a learned behavior, we suspect that he, in many cases, that is, um, sometimes it is biological, but... In many cases, it's learned. So we, we believe that he, you know, to learn behavior from him, 
uh, for him, rather, and that his, you know, his, his he either learned behavior for his father as well, or perhaps it is biological, but it, it's, it's so difficult to be to begin to even attempt to prove the biological aspect. You know, we're more focused on doing our best to prove uh, with, with the clinical data we have available, um, prove to the greatest degree that we can that he's at least highly likely to be diagnosable for antisocial personality disorder in, in the context in which he would have it would be a learned behavior for him. So seeing the behaviors of his father, it, it's easy to come to that conclusion. So how could you how could you not forgive somebody if they've been born and bred to have antisocial personality disorder? I mean, in some respects, the person didn't have much of a fighting chance, especially if it's uh, if it's a son and his father. You know, you have a, a father figure that has this disorder. What are the odds of the son being able to consistently resist it into his adult life and um, and not fall into it? Right. Well, I mean, on that topic, I tend to look at things as if somebody hasn't changed their behavior, if, if they don't say, look, I'm sorry I did this, and change, then they're still in a state of conducting you know, what they did. How can you forgive them if they're still doing it? Because he doesn't even know that he's doing it. I mean, he probably doesn't know he has the condition. He probably doesn't know his father has a condition. Um, he might he might know. Um, it's possible because he took all those psychology classes. So he might very well know. Um, but through through forgiveness comes tra- clarity of thoughts. If, if there's the old saying, "He who angers you controls you." If, if I couldn't get over my anger with Adam, I wouldn't be able to develop strategies to neutralize Adam. Um, if I spent all my time in anger, it wouldn't work. The thoughts wouldn't flow right, or the delivery of the thoughts that I had wouldn't come across pure or proper. It, it, would, it would, uh, wouldn't be conductive to, to my goals of just trying to protect everybody from the fallout that would come through an incident through the Kakeshites and Adam's irresponsible actions. So at least if we can have that set of checks and balances that is not, you know, commanded by me, but requested by me. If we have um, good Americans step up all over the country, we can have that set of um, citizen checks and balances. And I'm, I'm trusting the good judgment of the American people here. I'm not saying that, you know, oh, well, I'm going to make sure, and this is under my direction, and I'm telling people, you know, what to do. It's just, these are my suggestions. Um, you know, take them for what they're worth. I'm trusting that the people that have this information are going to do the right thing. And basically, I'm trusting that there's more good people in this country with guns than there are uh, mentally ill people in this country with guns. Right. Okay. Well, you know, I, it's interesting how you see these things in terms of good people versus mentally ill people instead of good people versus bad people i mean do you think that there are bad people do you think there's good people mentally ill and bad i mean what are your thoughts on that well it's interesting and you know who's to really say what's good and bad but i mean there's certain things that are unilateral i mean if you're you know you watch somebody commit a murder and it's unprovoked you know it's, it's unilaterally wrong it doesn't matter what uh of religion you believe in if any and it's that's something you know there has to be some type of standard uh, for what's right and wrong. So I think that most people um, that might be perceived as bad, um, you know, probably are mentally ill. And, uh, and like, as I said, some people are biologically born that way. So, you know, were they born evil? Um, yeah, I, I suppose that if somebody is born biologically that way, they, they were born evil. But um, can they control it? I mean, are they responsible for the evil if they were born biologically different? But that doesn't change... Um, necessarily how you would neutralize that evil. I mean, you, you can't just not fight um, somebody that's displaying these symptoms and manipulating people and hurting them. You can't just allow them to continue and say, well, it's not this person's fault, but, um, but when you're using restraint in regards to how you neutralize a threat, um, you know, to restrain or to, um, to injure as opposed to, you know, take things too far, to use the minimum amount of uh, physical force you need to do to do a threat as opposed to going overboard. You have to be you have to be better than the people that you need to confront physically, not stoop to their level. And it's a very fine line to walk, and it, it takes a lot of discipline, and, um, and it, it doesn't come easy um, to everybody. But uh, I, I have to put my faith in, in the people because I'd rather put my faith 
in the people at large getting this message and these recommendations and executing them responsibly. I'd rather put my faith in that than put my faith in the Kakeshites because I've interacted with enough of them to begin to profile them as a group and, and check out their demographics and whatnot. And it seems to be, you know, by the large, uh, 20 and 30 something year old males that, you know, clearly don't have um, positive role models in their life that they're following. So they're following Adam Kakesh and they're absorbing his mental illness and making it their own. And that's, that's part of what the ponderization process is. Okay. Now, now I've, you know, been speaking to you for, a couple of years now and I've seen you you know go through your your run for congress and and I want people to know that that Anthony Tolda is just a normal guy he's not some rich person that has a ton of money to run for congress and and you know would could you speak a little bit about what you're doing with the sovereignty party because it's like I see you involved in a lot of stuff here and I'm wondering how do you sort one thing from the other how do you how much time do you devote to the different things what are your ultimate goals here basically I try to do as much good as I can wherever I can and I spread myself pretty thin between you know uh, just regular work so I can pay my bills and you know doing what I do as a candidate as an activist as an individual as a volunteer um, to just try to set some things right and, and balance some things out in this world. And uh, when I see a void, you know, I don't agree with everything that Michael Savage says, but I've heard the man say some extremely intelligent things. And uh, you know, sometimes he says something that, you know, it's almost like he read my mind. And, you know, he said once, he goes, you know, I don't even necessarily want to be the one that's saying and doing the things that I'm saying and doing, but I see such a lack of it, such a void that, and I know that somebody needs to fill it, so I fill it. So when I see a void um, or, or just a cause that I, I'm passionate about, I do what I can to um, to work towards it and, and towards helping the situation, whether that's founding Shadow Militia or founding the Sovereignty Party of America. And, you know, I've dealt with the third parties. I've dealt with the Republican Party, and it's been a train wreck. And I just have to believe I could do better. So I founded the Sovereignty Party. And, you know, with this whole D.C. issue... It's it's kind of ironic, you know, a few short months, I founded uh, April 25th, 2012, so not that long after I found, you know, here's this these proposed D.C. march, and most people don't understand uh, D.C.'s uh, specific and privileged sovereignty status, and, you know, here I am uh, on various radio broadcasts explaining the privileged uh, sovereignty status and the uh, the history behind it, so... I feel like I've certainly earned the name at this point um, now, now that we're coming to this conversation. Right. And, you know, don't you think that Kokesh, or at least if he's being managed, whoever would have been managing him, they got to know that, that D.C. is not part of the United States of America and that, you know, you can go to prison for having a gun there, regardless what the Supreme Court ruled. They, st they still enforce that. How could – that's another thing to me. How could he ask other people to go there and submit themselves to prison? It's one or two things. I mean, either it was an honest oversight, like he could have just been, you know, totally overzealous and having that, uh, that vaulting ambition that Shakespeare war uh, war uh, warned us about. And just said, well, yeah, I'm going to D.C. because it's the best, you know, target. And they'll get some most press and all this stuff. And, you know, his handlers, you know, these people aren't always the brightest bulbs. Um, that's another thing about people with antisocial personality disorder. They're very, very crafty and very intelligent and oftentimes manipulate people um, that do not have a psychological disorder and get one over on them. So in some respects, there's a, there's a degree of intelligence there, but in other respects, they overlook a lot of things and don't think, don't tend to think things through as, as much as they should or as thoroughly as they should. So they slip up a lot. So if, if you're intelligent enough and you're, you're good natured, um, you can outsmart them if you know how to spot their behaviors and and just be have self discipline, let them to make you angry, and just wait for the opportune moment to outsmart them. Um, so it's either one or two things. Either they knew it. And it was part of the ruse to lure people in to, um, to you know, push an agenda or, or um, uh, allow for a government response that would have been a lot worse than had it been anywhere else. Because uh, personally, you ask me if D.C., if there's an attempt to be invaded on, uh, for, for D.C. to be invaded on, upon, 
D.C. is, they're not going to forget the Sovereignty Act. They're not going to forget the Residency Act, and they're not going to forget Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. They're going to remember pretty quick, and they're going to have an ironclad defense to totally overreact. Um, I mean, we're not going to consider it an ironclad defense, but the mainstream media would. So, you know, it was either a, a very nefarious plot to usher in martial law, or it was just an oversight due to arrogance and and vaulting ambition and and overzealous being overzealous. But either way, um, you know, it seems like he's he's gone sour on the idea, and it, it did come 24 hours after a video I put out there, and you know, I, I explained in the video how this is an invasion of a sovereign territory that they're not America, and I also explained that we recently got video footage of Kakesh calling the Constitution a failed experiment. So when you combine those two things, what do you know? Well, you know that, um, you know, he's he's disrespecting the Constitution, you know, and, and he's calling it a failed experiment. He's essentially saying, um, you know, he's not respecting or operating within it anymore. When you combine that with the fact that he's assuming a militia role and seeking to invade D.C., he's combining an implied act of war with a statement that, you know, he, he's considering the Constitution obsolete as a failed experiment. Something else he, he seems to have in common with Obama. Obama f- seems to feel the, uh, the Constitution is obsolete as well. <laughs> wow, that's, so, uh, I, think, I think that's a, a crucial point right there in that Kokesh agrees directly with Obama that the Constitution should be scrapped. I mean, that, you can't deny that, can you? Right, but I mean, the, you know, his twist on it as well, because of the abuses, and if it was that great, you know, we would have never had to deal with the abuses. No, that's, that's not it. If, if all the people that were, you know, following him like a bunch of little lemmings, um, if, if those types of people, you know, um, because those types of people will always exist, the people that follow people like Cash mindlessly without doing any due diligence, if those types of people have been fighting the way um, the types of people like you and I are, Harry, the whole time, we would have never had this problem. So there's a certain degree of, you know, responsibility on the with the public for dropping the ball as well. And, you know, granted, you know, we're up against people with a lot of power, a lot of money, that a lot of them have these mental disorders that make it easy to manipulate people. Um, you know, our educational system is awful. So, you know, in, in a sense, some people aren't giving a fighting a fighting chance. But a lot of it has to do with, you know, just being personally motivated and, and taking control, um, you know, taking your own power. And a lot of people choose to not do that. And they have, you know, we have freedom in America. They have uh, at least enough left of it. They have the freedom to not claim power for themselves. It's, that's their choice. But um, I think we certainly have a better America if more people were choosing to claim power for themselves that didn't have these mental disorders. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, we've we've taken up an hour and a half of your time, so I don't want to keep you up too late. I really want to thank you for coming on the broadcast, Anthony. And is there any uh, websites or anything you'd like to get out there? Sure. Uh, my old campaign website's still up. Um, it's still set up for donations, and I'm, I'm soft campaigning for Congress for 2014. You know, I'm not, I'm not aggressive about it right now because I'm building the party and just founded Shadow Militia, but... If you'd like to donate to me, um, you could at tolda2012.com. That's T-O-L-D like dollar, A like America, tolda2012.com. Um, we also have sovparty.org, which is sort of short for Sovereignty Party of America, sovparty.org. Um, that, that's relatively new. It's, it's not set up for donations yet, but we'll, we should have a P.O. box to send to um, by the end of tomorrow or the next day. Um, so those two websites I'd recommend. You could look us up on Facebook, Shadow Militia, uh, Shadow Militia on Facebook, uh, Sovereignty Party of America on Facebook, Anthony Tolda for Congress, Anthony Tolda. Any of those ways um, you could look for me and, and YouTube as well. Um, I have some interesting videos blowing the lid off of this whole Takesh scam or whatever it is. I, you know, it's like it's I'm halfway between believing he's an operative and just or he could just be individually crazy. But looking at his father and, you know, donations with him and the Democrat Party and the fact that he was a Democrat, you think about the Obama administration facing at least three or four impeachable, you know, scandals at one time. They're in fight-or-flight mode. This is the perfect thing that they would need to, you know, turn the attention towards the American people being bad, usurp a bunch of new powers, and 
keep themselves in power when you right. think about it. And, and Kakesh has the perfect cover when you think about it. As I was getting at earlier with with Obama, I, I kind of got off on a tangent telling you about the trial. But um, during the trial, they you know they had evidence that Obama and his mother were CIA uh, um, operatives. And when you think about the case of Obama, it kind of made sense. There weren't a whole lot of Americans that were able to speak, um, you know, the languages that Obama was able to speak. I believe it was Farsi or Arabic or both. Um, in the 80s, it, it, if you remember after 9-11, you know, they had difficulty finding people to translate some of these videos we were receiving. You know, they didn't have a whole lot of people that were, you know, working with the government to translate these videos for them. There's, there's a shortage. So there's certainly a shortage in the 80s. And uh, so his cover, supposedly, and according to this evidence, is that uh, he was a Kenyan businessman when he was traveling in Pakistan, and um, he was an American at other times. It's but you know he was able to have this Kenyan cover because his his father was Kenyan, so it was easy for him to uh, to have a Kenyan cover and then uh, the Kenyan passport and because of the dual citizenship of his father. That's another thing. You know, according to British law, um, any any person that's born to any British subject anywhere around the world, um, even if it's only one parent, they're automatically a British subject. You can't be born a dual citizen and a natural-born citizen. It's an automatic disqualification of status. So the location of the birth, the birth certificate, doesn't even matter. Just the fact that his father was a British subject According to British law, therefore compromising his natural born um, status capability or potential here, uh, you know, it's a dead in the water theory from the get go. He's not a natural born citizen. He could be a naturalized citizen um, or a citizen, but he can never be natural born. It's impossible. Right. Now, since you bring up the what's referred to now almost in a derogatory term by the mainstream media as the birther issue, I know Orly Tates was all over this, was that eventually resolved in any way, shape, or form? Is it still ongoing? What is the latest on that? It is. Um, Sheriff Joe Pio seems to be making the most headway um, at this moment, but uh, there's been plenty of other times where people are making headway, and unfortunately nothing happens. So, but, you know, when you think about it, though, when you have this issue, it's not going away. I mean, we don't know if anything's going to come of it, but it's not going away. Plus, you have Fast and Furious, you have Benghazi, you have the IRS scandal. It just, it really looks bad for this administration. And I suspect they're in a fight or flight syndrome and they're desperately trying to find a way to, um, to fight and stay as opposed to flight. And I suspect that this mess with Kakesh could be their perfect plot to, to stay. Right. Okay. Well, Anthony, thank you so much for being on air and and for all you do fighting for freedom up there in new york city and we look forward to hearing from you again all right sounds good harry always a pleasure to be on with you all right have a good night and that was anthony tolda up there in the nyc where he is tirelessly working to fight for the rights of people who really frankly don't deserve them it's hard to argue that that some of these people that sit around watching television stuff and potato chips in their mouth deserve the good efforts that people like him put forward. But, you know, as I always say, when you defend your rights, you're defending everyone's rights. In other words, people like me who get in armed standoffs with the police when they try to violate the Fourth Amendment by walking into my home might make them think the next time, well, maybe I won't just go ahead and barge in this home. Even though that's just some fat slob stuffing potato chips in his mouth who doesn't even have a gun. Just sitting there watching TV. And in the same sense, all of the work being done by all of the activists exposing truth, promoting freedom, benefits everybody. In the same sense, all of the work not being done by those who just sit around and do nothing hurts everybody. We would like to thank all who tune in, and especially all who bring others to the network so that we can unplug them from the false reality. Remember you can show people how to tune in on their cell phones by searching their internet radio application for TVN. Truth Broadcast Network would especially like to thank its tireless broadcasters who sacrifice their time, energy and resources working against the enemy. There is a price to pay, for their selfless efforts enlightening the world. 
Thus we thank broadcasters and ask the audience to be supported by spreading the word about live broadcasts and spreading the archives as much as possible.